share with you. This story is something which affects each and every one of your lives. This place here that we are standing, people before us, a hundred years ago, they stood in this very park and they discussed what we are discussing today. They had discussion, discussions about politics, about religion, about philosophy. And today we are here as their inheritors and they are gone from this world. And what I want to share with you today is we as human beings, we are fascinated by iPhones, by satellites, by televisions, by the internet, by fame, by celebrities, by football games. And if you go to the high street, just like flies are attracted to light, human beings are attracted to shops. And they go and they go and they buy technologies. And they look at something and they're fascinated by the design by the elegance, by the sophistication. But I want to ask you guys a question. Do you not think to yourselves about the marvel of the mind that created the phones that people stare at, rather than staring at the phone? Do you not marvel at the brain that created the architecture that you're staring at? And this is what I want to speak about today. We, from a young age, we are indoctrinated. We are indoctrinated and we are told, don't worry about these things, just work nine to five. You're here today, you're gone tomorrow, enjoy yourself. But does this really make sense? Does it make sense that we have opened our eyes to this world and we will close our eyes never to open them again? Does it make sense that the one who created us from nothing will not bring us back to life? Does it make sense that we right now are conscious and when we die, there will be no consciousness. Does it make sense that as a helpless child will have the same outcome as Adolf Hitler? These things don't make sense. What makes sense is behind design, there is a designer. Behind intelligence, there is, an, there is a knowing being. There is a creator. Every single thing around us is a sign. I want you guys to consider something. There is a small flea. It is called the Daphina flea. And this flea, when it is in water, when it realizes there's a predator, in its development, in its embryonic stage, it develops in such a way that it grows a helmet and it grows a tail spike so it can defend itself. Now I want to ask you, the creator who made this world and made all the fleas and made all the human beings, you don't think that creator who gave intelligence to a flea to protect itself and give it a helmet and a tail spike, you don't think that creator can reveal something to one amongst us? And this is what the messengers were. The messengers were human beings like us, like Moses and Jesus and Abraham. And they had a message which was revealed to them by God. And what was the message? It was not complicated. It was not something that you would spend years studying theology. It was very simple. And the message was, there is nothing worthy of worship except God. And that our lives and our goals should be in line with worshipping God. Something very simple. And something alongside this message, which the Quran emphasizes, is Materialism will never give you happiness. Buying the iPhone 7 will never buy you happiness. Buying a home in Paris will not give you happiness. What will give you happiness is when you do what you are created to do. The eye is to see, the ears are to hear, the heart is to contemplate. There is a reason for our existence. And that reason, when we fulfill it, which is to worship God, that is when we will have true happiness. We will not have happiness if we just follow our whims and desires. And the people we sometimes look up to, the scientists who we say, no, there's no need for God. There's no need for God. Science explains everything. Let me just give you one aspect of their delusion. Just one aspect and there's many. They say life started some three to four billion years ago with the first cell. 
and all of us today, and all the elephants, fleas and flies, and all human beings came via that self. And that this gradual evolution, this gradual Darwinian mechanism created all of us blindly. But let me just ask you something. Why do they say one origin? Why not seven? Why not 19? Where did that first life come from? And one man, his name is Francis Crick, the one who discovered the structure of the DNA, who won a Nobel Prize for that. He was an atheist evolutionary biologist. Do you know what he says in his book, Life Itself? What he says about the first cell? He says the first cell may have been seeded on Earth by aliens from outer space. Does that make sense to you? He couldn't explain the first cell naturalistically without God. So he started talking about aliens. And this is exactly what Richard Dawkins says. And the fact of the matter is this. When we turn away from God, we end up in darknesses of doubt, coupled over darknesses with doubt. We don't have certainty. The only one that can give us certainty is the one who created us. He is the one who can tell us how life began. We don't need people to come up with their conjectures. The fact of the matter is this, your mind is more complex than any computer in the world. There is more information in your mind than there are books in the world. In the world today, there's 130 million books that are printed. 130 million books. Imagine the amount of information in those books, yet your brain has more information than 130 million books. And the first thing, when you look at information, you infer there is some intelligence behind that. You don't just say this is a product of chance. You don't walk along the beach and you see the words, I love you. And you don't think to yourself, hang on a second, this might be a cosmic accident. You think to yourself, who wrote that? So I want to ask you, the one who put information inside of you, you don't think he would reveal external information for your own guidance? The Quran's message is simple. And the message is, you worship none but the Creator. And you follow all of his prophets. And what I began with, what I began with is consumerism. We are told, we are told to work nine to five and to live day to day so that you can work, eat, die and sleep. And that's about it. But the Quran has a higher goal, a higher rationale for us beyond survival and reproduction. And that is to connect with the Creator and understand that a helpless child over there is not going to end up in the same place as Adolf Hitler. Our actions in this life determine what happens in the hereafter. And the ones who believe in God and believe in his messengers, they will have peace in this life and they will have paradise in the hereafter. And the ones that actively reject God, they will have nothing but hellfire. And we are told, we are told by people like this man standing across me, that there is no heaven as you can hear him say. There is no hell. But the fact of the matter is this, when you fall from a plane, it doesn't matter whether you believe in the law of gravity, it impacts you. So it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not. When you die, you will either go to paradise or go to hellfire. And you have this short life of 60, 70, 80 years to make that decision, which will either make you end up in bliss for eternity or in the blaze for eternity. And that choice really boils down to this. Do you accept that there's none worthy of worship except God? And do you accept that all of his messengers from Moses, Abraham, Jesus, and the Prophet Muhammad are the messengers that we should follow and try and emulate in our life? And if you make the decision to accept that, you will go to paradise for eternity. I thank you very much for listening. Excuse me, a question. Yes, sir. Um, yes. Where, you know, I believe there's heaven and hell. Yes. The question like, for example, Muslims, yes. killing fellow Muslims, yes. Christians, you know, yes. where do you think they go after that? What? Like Sunni nope. killing, killing Shia or Shia killing Sunni or the, Wahhabi, you know? The, the fact of the matter is this, sir. The Yemen war. The fact of the matter is this. 
There is one out of four people on earth are Muslim. Yeah, yeah. And Islam is a big dynamic group. So you have political reasons why people kill each other. But regardless of who kills who, the fact of the matter is you're going to be accountable to God for every single action okay, you take. So and the Quran's message, sir, is very, very simple. The Quran says, whoever takes a life of a human being, it is as if he's taken the lives of all human beings. Because we believe all human beings are alive today, they come from an original couple of Adam and Eve. So we believe killing one person is equivalent to killing all of humanity. So I don't agree with when people bring up political issues and try and refute theology, because these are two different things. Yeah, so the, because, oh, sorry. What is your message uh, different from the message of Christianity or, Ju or Judaism? You actually say that you have to follow the, 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 the concept of the Creator. And what is, what is different than what the Christian says or the, or the Jewish one says? What, what's so special about the Quran? That's a good question. Firstly, we believe in all of the prophets which were sent to the Jewish people. We believe in also the prophets which were sent to uh, the Christians or the ones that the Christians accept like uh, Jesus and John the Baptist. We accept them all. So we don't make the claim that Islam is a new religion. Islam is the continuation of the Abrahamic faith and that's all it is. So in, in, the, in regards to how it is different to Christianity and Judaism, it is different in the sense that when Islam was revealed, it got changed over time. All Islam means submission to God. So the Jews, they changed their religion and so did the Christians. The Christians were told to worship God. Instead, they started worshiping Jesus. So Islam restores the message of Jesus and restores the message of Moses. Now you said to me, why is the Quran special? That's a different question. And I think it's a very interesting question. If I was to tell you there is a book in the world and this book in the world makes a prediction and this prediction comes true, then it's the onus is on you to find out what's in this book and why does it have information which we've only discovered today. And likewise, if there was a man 1400 years ago who said certain particular things and those particular things came true 1400 years later, then the onus is on you to ask what's special about this man, what was his message that he knew some information which we didn't know. Just to give you an example of what the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him 1400 years ago, he said, the day of judgment will not come until you see the desert Arabs, the, the barefooted desert Arabs, build buildings that are going to compete with the skies, with, that are going to compete with each other. When he said this, he could have easily said this about the Romans. He could have said this about the Persians. He could have said this about the Inca people. He could have said this about the Egyptians because they all had civilizations. The Arabs used to live in tents. They didn't even have houses. But he said, these guys are going to build buildings which are going to be competing with each other. And today in the world, even if you look in the Middle East, when you go to Qatar or Bahrain, they have the tallest buildings in the world. And even here in London, we have the Shah, which is the tallest building in Western Europe built by the Qataris. These people, 60, 70 years ago, they were camel herders. Right? They were camel herders. My grandfather, I'm originally from Pakistan. My grandfather was born almost 100 years ago. He told me when people from Pakistan or India, when they went over to Hijaz, Saudi Arabia, the Arabs there used to beg them for money because they were so poor. Today, these are the richest people in the world. That's just one prediction. But if I was to tell you, this isn't just a vague prediction. This is a prediction which is falsifiable. Because if the Prophet gave information which we can counter through observation, then it's falsifiable and it's testable. Likewise, the Quran makes a prediction. And one prediction of the Quran makes is this. 1400 years ago, when Islam was a little tiny religion in Central Arabia, the Quran made a prediction. And it said, it is he who has sent his messenger with truth, with the religion of truth and guidance, so that it may prevail over all systems, all religions. Today, Islam is one of the biggest religions in the world and it is in every 
single corner of the world. And this is a Quranic prediction which we are seeing unfolding in front of us. Likewise, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, he sent letters to the Persians, he sent letters to the Romans, he sent letters to the Africans. And when he sent those letters, some of them rejected him. And he said a very particular, a very particular prophecy. The Khosro, the leader of the Persians, he rejected him and he ripped up his letter. So the Prophet said that this man will be removed and after him there will be no Khosro. There will be no leader of the Persians, that particular title. After he died, the Persian Empire, which had existed for hundreds of years, that was destroyed. And the Prophet also said about the Romans, they were a superpower at the time. He said, you're going to conquer them. And he said about Egypt, he said, you're going to conquer that. And he said about Syria, you're going to conquer that. And about all of these predictions that he made, including Yemen, these happened within a few years of his death. Let me just explain to you what that's similar to. That's similar to today, the president of Ghana saying, in five years or 10 years or in 50 years time, my nation is going to defeat America and Russia because Persia and Byzantine, they were the leading superpowers in the world. And the Prophet said that, no, you will conquer them. And he said to a man, you are going to wear the crowns of the leader of the Persians. And that's exactly what happened. I have another question. No, sir, let me just end on this point. So everything I'm saying, it could be wrong, but the onus is on you to find out more. All I'm doing is I'm giving you a little reason why there's something special about this book and why there's something special about the Prophet Muhammad. Okay, I have another question uh, regarding to what you said. Um, why is Islam is the only religion that believes in the, in the principle of dying for the religion, in the jihad principle? In Judaism, you don't see it. The, 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 the crucifix, uh, uh, about the word, uh, the crusade, where only political uh, journeys. Why is the Islam only religion who uh, is talking about dying to like to uh, killing for your religion as a uh, an, uh, as a commandment? As a commandment. The question is about jihad. The fact of the matter is this. Jihad is a spiritual struggle. That is what the word means. So in the Quran, when it is used, it is used in different contexts. But one thing which God makes clear is this. When you fight, it should be for a just cause. So you don't just decide one day to wake up and think, okay, let's invade China. It doesn't work like that. The way it works is this. In Islam, we believe that when people are wronged, when men, women and children are under siege and they are killed, there is the right of them to be protected. And if someone does that and while they are doing that, they die in that act, we believe that they go to paradise. We don't believe in senseless killing, in suicide bombing and in all of this stuff that you see online. We don't believe in that. We don't believe in this sort of ISIS ideology. That's not Islam. What we believe in is just warfare. And that is that without a reason, you don't just attack someone. Islam teaches in the Quran says to be tolerant and kind towards people. When Muslims took over India, for example, where I'm originally from, Muslims ruled India for hundreds of years, over 500 years. They didn't go around converting everyone to Muslim. They do in the part, don't they? They, try to go they, they gave people the freedom of religion. The Quran says there is no compulsion of religion. But, sir, you can ask me. You can. You can ask me. You can ask me a question. Yes, it does say that. It does say that. It does say that. Yes, it's on your desk. There's no compulsion. What's wrong with that? There's no compulsion of religion. You go to hell if you don't believe. Okay, I agree. You agree. So it's not very nice thing to believe that if you don't, someone doesn't agree with you. But hang on, hang on. What's your definition of nice? Nice. I don't think it's nice to actively reject the Lord that created you. That's not nice. You're assuming there's a Lord that created that you know something about. I don't believe you know anything about. Okay, so you're saying that I believe you're a professional speaker and your organisation. How much money does it get? Eight hundred thousand a year. Eight hundred thousand a year. How would that prove? 
actually a professional speaker, what's your salary? Uh, 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 I've lost £40,000 a year. I'm you a professional speaker. Working. No, I'm I just, I'm a truth seeker. I'm a truth seeker. The fact of the matter is this. We can go off on tangents, but I'm here it's to talk about something you're, very particular. You're talking on behalf of an organisation. Sir, 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 well, you, you would if you turn to alternative news. For example, if you go to BBC, if you go to Al if you go to the BBC, they don't give Muslims a voice. But the fact of the matter is this, the Quran is very, very clear. Whoever takes the life of a human being is as if they take the lives of all human beings. Unless, what are the conditions? If you read the full quote of the Quran, there are certain conditions, conditions to that, unless they are disruptors in the land. If somebody stood up, I, 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 I disagree with the Quran, they'd be called a disruptor in the land, and then they could be put to death. So they respect everybody in Islam, as long as as they keep quiet, you know, respect as long as they submit to Islam, they respect it. If you don't submit to Islam, you're in trouble. Okay, okay, so let me just ask you, if what you said is correct, let's, just assume, right. let's assume what you said is correct. Yeah. Why is it that the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, where all the sciences today trace themselves back to, you had atheists, Christians, Jews, Muslims, agnostics, fire worshippers, Hindus, people from all across the world, all of their philosophies in one place, and you had this coffee house of ideas. Why did that happen if what you said is true? What I'm talking about is now, in the modern world today, alternatives are for Malaysia. They're Malaysian Chinese, right? And the students are Muslim, no free education in England because they're Muslim. And they, uh, Chinese are Buddhist and not pay. And another thing, any business in, in like Malaysia, if it's Chinese business, I have to take a Muslim. It, it just sits there as a part and it does nothing. Right? Uh, but I always have Muslims first in Malaysia. Forty years ago, you could see a Sorry, is that in the Quran? What? Just to clarify, the things you're talking about, is that in the Quran? In the Quran, in the Quran, in the Quran, in the Quran. politics, the Quran. Sorry, I'm just confused because Malaysia, you were mentioning Malaysia. Sir, and you were talking about the Quran first, so I'm talking about Think about the question which I asked you about the House of Wisdom. The fact well, of the matter is this. We are told today that from a young age, till the time that you are at university, there is no God. Religion is backward. We're told all of life is explained through Darwinian evolution. No, we're not. I was never told that. I'm a truth seeker. I was told to, to get the truth. You have to be Aristotle. Later, and if you're Chinese, Chinese, we Confucius as well. When I was at school, yeah. I wasn't taught that. No. People in school are not taught that. Maybe you came from a different era. I, 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 I thought to myself. Okay, no, that's not I'm challenging today. Yeah. I'm challenging today. Yeah. I'm challenging today. Yeah. I'm challenging today. Yeah. If we are taught yeah. that yeah. when you evolution explains life, and you don't need God. Yeah. That's a red trick that's being taught. What I'm doing today, I'm challenging. That, I don't think it makes sense. I've got something superior to Islam. You're going to be lady. Superior. And, and anyone would be great. What is the greatest word? Just put in your words. Any Muslim, tell me what the greatest word is. Let me tell you that. Okay. The greatest good is to worship God. The greatest good, according to Aristotle, is to worship God. Forget him. Forget him. Who's that? 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 Who's we shouldn't look at the world from a European centric worldview. And I'm, I'm sorry, but this is what we get in the world today. We just get told as if the Western worldview is the world. As if there is, that is the, that is the, that is the apex of the human race almost. The fact of the matter is this. The fact of the matter is this. Even in the descent of man, what does Darwin say? He just reiterates in a different way what you're saying. He speaks about how the highest are who? 
the Europeans, the English, the white. Confucius is right. European. How long has Confucius been the And going down, as his contemporary Earth and Kettle did, he puts down the human races. You have whites, and then you slowly have Chinese, and then you have Asians, and then going down you have the black. Sir, you have the black, and underneath the black, you have the apes. And the distance between the whites and the blacks is greater than that distance between the blacks and the apes. Now this nonsense, which is taught, that's what I'm trying to challenge. And your answer, when I asked the rational question, was to go to Aristotle. Why is it that we're always taught? If you want to reason or use logic or use common sense, it must go back to a bunch of guys in Greece wearing togas. Where does that come from? Why does that even make any sense? And this thinking, this thinking, animals sir, should be healthy, plants sir, should be healthy, sir, and sir, that is the, the idea of healthy is, children. I'm here to debunk nonsense, and what you're saying right now is actually nonsense. Is it nonsense to be healthy? I'm also here to talk about how the same people who teach us this nonsense to about healthy. scientific racism are the same people who even though they win Nobel Prizes, like Francis Crick, they believe human beings and all of life originally were sent down to Earth before they were developed by aliens. And people like Richard Dawkins defends this. I'm here to challenge these nonsensical views because I think one person's view should be challenged if it doesn't make sense. Why do you think humans were not sent by aliens? Okay, anything that you believe in should be based upon evidence. Have you seen any aliens lately? No, but I've seen aliens. But, uh, you know, so there's only the cultures like ancient Egypt and appeared out of nowhere. Were you around? How old are you? Well, we were here since the first time. If you want to know, we were around around Jesus or behind Jesus. Okay, no, but... Where, where did the ancient Egyptians come from? They came from aliens? We don't know. But there was nothing. And then suddenly... But how do you know there was nothing? How do you know there was nothing? Their theology tells us. Uh, at one point, you know, there is nothing. And 200 years later, there are temples, there is writing, completely, uh, complete cultural system, you know, complete system of writing. Where did it come from? Sir, it came from the, came from the how, people. How does archaeology work? No, no. I know well, they, uh, I know take, that. When yeah, they, they take some rights, they take... And how many say archaeology for or fossils or this or any college right before it? How much percentage recovery do you think we have of life that existed? You cannot tell that, but uh, in each of the much Okay, let me just give you one suggestion. According to the National Science Foundation, 99.9999% of all species that have ever existed, not organisms, species, have never been observed. So that gives you a little bit of a hint about just how reliable archaeology, paleontology, or the fossil record actually is. All we can actually do is this. We can use the evidence we have now to make inferences. I agree, your inferences might be different to mine, but we need to try and find what is the best inference. And I think it makes more sense to look at information in the DNA and the fact that we are conscious, moral, intelligent beings far more than what is needed for survival or reproduction, to infer from that that we have an origin which is not naturalistic, that we didn't just come together by a cosmic accident. I think that's, that's, that's a nonsensical worldview, and that's what I'm challenging today. The fact of the matter is this. I want to leave you guys just with one message. This life is short. We're only here for the twinkling of an eye. And the hereafter is for eternity. So question these assumptions which are taught to us. That life can be explained naturalistically. That there is no God. That God doesn't reveal himself to mankind. And know that happiness lies in the worship of God. And the message of all the messengers from Adam to the Prophet Muhammad was that none is worthy of worship except God. I thank you all for listening.